Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to all of you that are tuning in and joining us today. My name is Shaila Raghav. I'm the Vice President of Climate Change from a nonprofit conservation international based in Arlington, Virginia. And I'm so honored to be the moderator for today's event, which brings together for corporate leaders to discuss the role of nature-based solutions to bring about a new paradigm of development and growth for the private sector. Um, one that can be defined not by exploitation and extraction from nature, but one that can be defined by restoration, regeneration, and respect. So how can we actually change and rethink our business models um, um, in terms of really um, redefining and revisiting um, the private sector's role to play in deploying and accelerating accelerating nature-based solutions. So I think we all can also appreciate that 2021, this year in particular, um, has an in incredible amount of attention being placed on nature. There's mounting public and political awareness. We know that there are two big uh, uh, negotiations and UN events uh, focused on biodiversity and nature later this year. And we have less than a decade to reach the goals of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And so our key question here really is, how do we work together with nature to ensure that more can be produced with less and that we can meet our development goals and needs without destroying the very planet that sustains us? And from a climate change perspective, which is really what I spend most of my time, we really, I think, recognize move towards um, not just commitments, but also action. So I'll start off by just providing a quick uh, overview of what we mean by nature-based solutions and what we mean by regenerative landscapes in the context of this event. Nature-based solutions really is a broad term that refer refers to a solution set um, that relates to essentially how we manage land and how we manage natural ecosystems. Um, these solutions are motivated and supported by a desire to maximize environmental, economic, and social benefits while increasing resiliency. Resiliency of that natural ecosystem, but also of the human populations that are dependent on that nature. And from a climate change mitigation perspective, we know through late, the recent and latest science that protecting, better managing, and restoring natural ecosystems can deliver a third or more of the solution to climate change um, over the next decade. Um, but realizing that potential really requires urgent and immediate action because we know also that only 3% of all climate finance is going towards nature. And even more concerning is that the amount of funding that is driving deforestation and the destruction of natural ecosystems is 40 times higher than any source of green finance. And so what we're here today to discuss is how do we correct that imbalance? How do we divert focus, attention, and funding to those extractive and exploitative activities that are destroying the life-supporting function of our planet to, do, to do those that are more regenerative and restorative? Um, Nature-based solutions are really concrete solutions. They're, they refer to specific actions that refer to how we manage land, um, but also they really um, must also elevate and support local communities and indigenous-led um, action. We know that local communities and, and indigenous communities in particular um, have long been stewards of natural ecosystems. Um, and what we also can discuss here is how the private sector can support these communities and support nature and, and integrate um, consideration of these social dimensions into their work um, to better deploy and better leverage um, the financing that's available within the private sector to generate those long-term, um, not only just financial, but also social and environmental returns. And so in terms of the private sector, um, we also know that um, a, a large number of companies have begun to make um, uh, deeper commitments on climate change. We've seen now net zero really become the benchmark and the standard um, for a number of companies, especially until the 2050 timeframe. Um, and so for this panel, we're going to hear diverse company experiences and perspectives to really demystify how companies can integrate nature-based solutions into their strategic and climate action plans. 
Um, we're going to hear about a solutions platform, a consumer goods company, an agriculture company, um, and a tech company, and how they're using their scale, their vision, and their unique business models to invest in nature. Um, our in intent for this event is, is that all of the, the insights and the examples that you'll hear today will really help um, provide some context and some inspiration to other corporate sustainability leaders um, to not only act on climate change um, and act on the imperative to protect natural ecosystems, um, but also to uh, inc increase our resilience and, and the well-being of humanity that depends on those ecosystems. So we have uh, four speakers um, that are joining me today for this conversation. The first is um, Andre Hoffman, who's the chairman of Intent and the vice chairman of Roche. We have Sven Torre Holsether, who is the president and CEO of Yara International. We have Max Scher, who is the head of clean energy and carbon programs at Salesforce. And last but not least, James McCall, the senior director for global climate and supply chain sustainability at Procter & Gamble. Um, Andre, you'll see, is not, is not um, uh, viewed here because he's going to be joining us via a video statement. Um, and so just a, a quick a note on housekeeping for those of you that are joining us, please feel free to share any questions or comments that you have in the chat. Um, and we will reserve about 20 minutes towards the end of, end of this event after we've heard from each of our speakers um, to uh, have an interactive discussion to take some of those questions. So with that, we'll start um, with an intervention from Andre Hoffman. Um, Andre is a businessman, environmentalist, and philanthropist. He's a, he's a passionate advocate for um, business being a force for good. He's the vice chairman of Roche Holding, uh, which is a family business. He also sits on the board of Systemic and the board of trustees of the World Economic Forum um, and the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, he has a distinguished career in nature conservation, and most recently he founded Intent, which is a platform promoting innovative solutions for the implementation of the sustainable development goals. The question that we've posed to Andre for his intervention is to what extent do wetlands play a crucial role within regenerative practices and what are some of the benefits that are linked to, to well-functioning wetlands? So with that, let's cue Andre's intervention. Thank you very much, Sheila, for, for this question, and I'm very grateful that you chose to invite me here today. I'm sorry I won't be able to be there physically. Um, well, I wouldn't have been physically anyway, but I'm sorry I, won't, I cannot participate to the debate because of a previous commitment. Um, it is a, a real privilege to be able to come and talk to you about wetlands, because wetlands are a subject which is, which is very close to my heart. I, have, I in fact, grew up in a wetland in the, in the Camargue, and since then I have a passion for this um, uh, particular uh, part of the world which is not attractive at first sight but it has such of an incredible complexity, diversity and richness and very real contribution possibilities to mankind. Um, when we talk about, about wetlands we should not just concentrate ourselves on conservation, we should rather talk about the dynamic element of how can humanity and wetlands develop together. And that's really very much the purpose of these regenerative practices we are talking about today. I'd like to, to, to draw the emphasis onto the title here. If you talk about regenerative practices, it's because we have gone over the point of no return already. Mm -hmm. So if we, want to, um, if we want to avoid the tipping point of uh, the planetary limits, we need to make sure that we change practices in how we use natural, social and human capital. And regenerative practices are very much about this. Um, in these regenerative practices, um, uh, I hope to see a, a, a dimension of bringing back and not just taking, which I suspect will help us in the long term to restore uh, nature into a way where it is at, at service of humanity and not just seen as a free for all uh, trove of treasures. I think the important issue here, um, when we talk about regenerative practices, is to evolve a system which will allow us to contribute to the solution and not just contribute to the problem. Um, wetlands are in a state of disarray all across the planet, and in particular they're being drained much faster than they're being recreated. 
uh, because they're seen as fertile land for development, because they're flat and they're usually quite well irrigated. So that uh, attracts uh, attention of a lot of developers and that's something we need to combat. The only way to combat this is by demonstrating the benefit of a well-functioning wetlands compared to a prime land for development. These are two different issues. A development is something in which you put money in order to get to a higher state of development and I don't think you should be doing that with wetlands which work very well as they are. Um, the Station Biologique de la Tour du Valais in the Camargue has spent a lot of time studying wetlands, how do wetlands function and what contribution can they make to the system in which they are. Um, uh, we use them in particular for three main functions. One is storage, one is purification of water and the other one is moderation of variation in lapping water flows. Um, in the Camargue specifically, in the wetlands that have recently been vacated by industrial salt production, we introduced a system which allows us to manage uh, the flooding or suffering uh, uh, rise of wetlands. No, sorry, uh, a system which allows us to store excess water in during the great floods in at different times of the year. Uh, that means that despite the fact that the sea level is rising, we can manage sort of the impact on the delta by storing it and releasing it slowly into the sea. Um, that uh, particular program has been now investigated for nearly 10 years and it's yielding some very interesting clues into how you can manage uh, sea, le sea, sea level ra rising in the, in the Mediterranean. There are numbers of other opportunities to do it with wetlands, of course. I mean, reed beds are very good at purifying water in a very biological ma manner, so no need for retreatment plants. But there are also the capacity at storing water in, the, in, in times of uh, drought, uh, in particular in the southern Mediterranean. This is particularly important for agricultural practices. In, uh, human practices, and in particular human practice towards wetland over the years, have been focused on uh, merciless development. Uh, uh, wetlands were seen as unused capacity, and therefore they had to be transformed. And that, this is a philosophical point which I consider very important. We tended to dominate uh, the wetlands habitat rather than trying to work, make it work for us. A wetland as an ally is a cheaper solution to water management problem than an artificialization of the same surface for technology. Thank you, Andre, for those remarks and, and uh, what you've said very much resonated with me in terms of this um, really operationalizing a regenerative model that doesn't seek to dominate um, or destroy nature or take from nature, but rather recognizes all of the value and benefit of, of protecting and working with nature. Um, so now let's turn to our next speaker, who's Sven Holsether. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Yara since 2015. He is a passionate, he's been passionate about promoting the sustainable development goals in the global business arena um, and to contribute to a thriving future and to drive inclusive growth. He's also been a member of the executive committee and chair of the Food and Nature Program for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And he was the commissioner of the Business and Sustainable Development Commission and also serves on the executive committee and board of the International Fertilizer Association. So welcome Sven, and my question for you is that agriculture contributes a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions, um, but natural climate solutions could also deliver a third of the emissions um, drawdown that's required over the next decade. As the CEO of Yara, which is a global crop nutrition company, what do you see as the potential for soil and what is Yara doing to accelerate nature-based solutions? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Shaila, and I really appreciate your opening uh, remarks and, uh, and also what we heard from uh, Andre, uh, highly interesting. Yeah, let, let me share some of my thoughts uh, from, from our side as a, as a crop nutrition uh, company. And, and let me first say that uh, soil uh, is, a, is a precious and a vital resource for uh, for us humans and, and also for uh, for for nature uh, but we're absolutely not giving it the attention that it uh, deserves um, and, and that's in spite of the link between 
soil and healthy food being crystal clear uh, and, and the great majority of the nutrients that we eat come directly from the soil and, and plants are just like us humans uh, they need a, a balanced and good nutrition to grow and, and be healthy and, um, and and when we harvest these plants we take nutrition from the field of the farmer and, and into the into the uh, uh, <laughs> into our kitchens and and and, uh, and, 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 and to our food that we we eat uh, and uh, because of that, we also need to look after the soil and, and, and use regenerative uh, practices to replenish the nutrients. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the past decades is that uh, we've seen significant soil depletion. We haven't treated the soil the way it needs to, to, to keep its, its balance. So the sad fact now is that the uh, crop grown decades ago uh, were much more nutritious uh, than uh, the, uh, the same crops are uh, today. So let me use an example. If you ate an orange uh, 50 years ago and you wanted to get the same nutritional value uh, today, you would have to eat eight of them. And, uh, and the reason for that is that we get what we pay for. Uh, and what we've been paying for is kilos. And that's it. Not how it's grown. And, and not the nutrition in it. So this has to, to, to change and, and it would also help uh, the, the farmers in, in becoming more uh, resilient and, and also more profitable. And then there's another opportunity when it comes to soil and that, it, uh, that is that it represents a major opportunity for carbon sequestration. The way we, in, in modern uh, agriculture, uh, we haven't fully uh, embedded the regenerative practices that could sequester carbon in the in the soil and by introducing incentives for the farmers where they actually get paid to change the practices where they are capturing carbon and we pay them for doing that service we provide another income for the farmers at the same time as we're doing something that is beneficial for the climate because today it's not enough to just reduce carbon emissions we need to sequester as well and that's where the the, the, the farmers come in. We cannot expect that the farmers should bear the full burden of this. Uh, we, we should have incentives in place to help them on this, uh, this uh, journey. And uh, last week, we uh, from, from here, we uh, launched the Agoro Carbon Alliance, which is aiming to create a marketplace for the farmers to, uh, to capitalize and, and, and to create income based on the carbon that they are capturing. That includes training in, in, in the practices, Given them the right advice in how to to drive this, and, and it's also about the quality of the of the credit, so that uh, uh, they have a product that they can sell to uh, to to customers that need uh, offsets, for instance, and uh, and and that so that they get the right value for it. So the, the demand for carbon credits will only uh, increase, and uh, I think it's important that we create a system that can help to make this systems uh, change to enable that and at the same time also do this uh, in a way that benefits the, the farmers in addition to the climate and, and the soil and nature as well. So I, I think I'll keep it there now, uh, Shaila, and, and hand back to you. Thank you, Sven. So it seems like it's a combination of two things from your intervention. One is increasing the nutritional value of food and increasing productivity reduces the, 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 the need for, for the use of land or the expansion of the agricultural footprint or um, even on, dis, uh, on deforestation to make way for additional uh, land for food production. Uh, and the second is tapping into innovative financial mechanisms so that we can get the funding where it needs to go to uh, incentivize the type of behavior change that is going to allow us to deploy nature-based solutions. So thank you for your, for your intervention and looking forward to discussing further. Um, so now we'll turn to our next speaker, who's Max Scher. He's the dis uh, Director of Sustainability at Salesforce. Um, he's a senior member of the sustainability team and his work focuses on climate change Start. 
and also Salesforce's goal um, to support and mobilize co the conservation, restoration, mm -hmm. and growth of 100 million trees by the end of 2030. Looking forward to hearing more about that goal and how Salesforce is going to meet it. So um, Max, can you tell us more about Salesforce's interest in nature-based solutions? As a tech company, why is nature such a big area of focus for Salesforce as part of Salesforce's climate strategy? Uh, thanks, Shaila, and thanks for having me. That is the, uh, I think, fundamental thing that I bring to this panel is, although we are not a agricultural company, although we're not um, at our core focus on agriculture, we, like everyone, are, uh, we, as everyone needs to be, are, are stepping up to the challenge of, of climate change and nature conservation and restoration. I mean, the fact is, this can't just be a, um, this, this has to be something that we all take on, just like all of our global goals. Um, we all must be accountable. We all must be stepping up. And we're attempting to do that as part of our Nature for Climate initiatives at Salesforce. Um, for those of you who don't know, yes, Salesforce is a technology company in, in San Francisco, California. Um, for us, for, for nature, we've really been focused on, on trees. Um, and since uh, some of the other speakers have already talked about some of the other great solutions in the natural climate solutions set, that's where I'm going to um, speak a little bit today. Um, <clears throat> trees, uh, as potentially one of the largest climate solutions this decade, um, once covered about half of the earth. So um, before the agricultural revolution, let's say we had about six trillion trees. Um, since that time, we have fed, clothed, housed billions of people. Um, at the same time, we've degraded or lost half of those forests. And that has fueled our biodiversity and climate crisis as we find ourselves in today. And I think most of you listening will know that it's time that we stop that. We need to stop taking from our natural ecosystems and we need to start giving back. And that's why in uh, January of 2020, we helped the World Economic Forum stand up 1T.org, which is a <clears throat> dedicated platform to conserving, restoring, and growing uh, 1 trillion trees by, by 2030. Um, 1T.org, um, which I, I hope you will all go to 1T.org and um, get involved. Uh, drives change by mobilizing the private sector, facilitating multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, in key regions like the US where they launched their first chapter this year uh, and supporting innovation and ecopreneurship on the ground through platforms like Uplink, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> the, in, in the first year, like I mentioned, uh, they, they did launch the US chapter of 1T.org with uh, public sector, private sector, civil society partnerships, um, over a 1 billion trees have already been pledged uh, and a great community of practice has already sprung up in the U.S. So those in the U.S., you can also go to us.1t.org and um, get involved. Another thing I'm really happy about for the first year uh, for, for this effort was the Trillion Trees Challenge on Uplink. So uh, Uplink is a uh, digital platform that's built on Salesforce, run by the World Economic Forum to crowdsource innovative solutions to the sustainable development goals. And the Trillion Trees Challenge was meant to crowdsource solutions to the ecosystem conservation and restoration goals of the world. And um, I, again, encourage folks to check that out as well. We had some fantastic uh, ecopreneurs innovators um, surfaced through that platform, about over 300 already. And we have a new challenge running right now um, in the Sahel region. Um, <clears throat> Now, of course, that's the, the partnership where we try and uh, learn so that we can act. Um, our acting takes on a number of different facets, but uh, we have set our own goal, as, as Shaila mentioned, uh, to conserve, restore, and grow 100 million trees um, by the end of the decade. And we have announced the funding of the first 10 million. And you know, the main lesson learned, if I can leave folks with something, is that even if you are a, uh, a tech company or if you're, this isn't your um, you know, main focus as an institution, you can take action too. And you can go to 1T.org and, and find out more and get some guidance there. Um, you can also go to salesforce.com slash trees and see all the projects that we've supported thus far. Of course, funding is step one, and then there's a lot that needs to happen from there. Um, but I'm really excited about the number of great projects we found out there. The other thing we learned, however, is how hard it is to find those. And so there is a lot that we need to do to enable uh, this community to, to act together. Um, and I, I think that'll be the challenge over the next couple of years in, in building this movement. Um, <clears throat> of course, for us, you know, funding is one step, but and I encourage folks to do that as well. But 
Um, think about what your special power is. For us, it's our technology. Um, so doing things like uh, Uplink to support finding ecopreneurs has been a focus for us, and we hope to build on that. Um, also critical is, of course, advocating for the systemic change we want to see. So policy advocacy has become a bigger and bigger part of our, of our work. Um, I, I'm really excited to answer questions and, and hopefully get more folks in, in this movement with us. Um, for now, I'll say, you know, there, there's a unique opportunity actually coming up to be a leader on Forest by joining the inaugural cohort of companies that will be announced uh, as part of 1T.org's um, initial group of companies at the uh, Singapore uh, World Economic Forum Summit in August. So if you're interested, please go to 1T.org, uh, check out corporate engagement and, and get in touch with the World Economic Forum team. Um, I'll, I'll back to you, Shah. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Max. I took three things from your remarks. One being that we're, we're confronting ex, uh, exponentially accelerating problems at the global scale. So we can't afford to um, you know, um, uh, silo these problems. It's really important that we see these as collective action responsibility for us as a global community. The second is find out what your unique perspective or approach could be or, or what your own vantage point or expertise can bring to a problem. So even a tech company can help with planting trees. Um, and then the last thing is just helping to source um, good ideas on the supply side and making sure that we have good projects um, and good recipients for um, all of the funding that we're seeing now coming to bear for climate. So thank you, Max, and looking forward to dialogue with you a little later. So now Thank we'll you. turn to our last speaker, who is James McCall. James leads Procter & Gamble's Global Supply Chain Sustainability Program, helping one of the world, world's largest consumer public goods companies uh, reduce their environmental footprint with energy, climate, water, waste, forestry, transportation, and raw materials. By integrating circular manufacturing processes across Procter & Gamble's end-to-end -end supply chain, including 150 uh, facilities in nearly 40 countries, James and team have been able to successfully decouple Procter & Gamble's global growth from their environmental footprint for more than a decade. James has personally championed some of Procter & Gamble's largest sustainability projects, including the recent shift to purchasing 100% renewable electricity across the United States, Canada, and most of Europe. So welcome, James. Um, so my question for you is last year, P&G committed to be a carbon neutral uh, company for the decade, uh, including launching several natural climate solutions projects. Can you share some of your learnings um, that, that you and others have, have uh, learned as you developed these projects and, and embark now on the implementation phase? Absolutely. Um, first, thank you for having me today and thank you for inviting uh, PNG to participate in the SDG tent event this week. So, uh, you know, I, I think our first couple of learnings were in setting our goal. Um, for PNG, we really see this as a critical window to start to make a change for the world today and also for future generations. And so, you know, for us, it was critical to set a goal that was not off in the future, but what could we do today? And so we feel like being carbon neutral now for the decade, all of our emissions from now until 2030 was a step change that we could make in the short term to try to have an impact. Uh, our first learning is you need to start with your own emissions. Um, and, you know, the most important thing we can do is to reduce our emissions. And the most important emission is the one that we never produce. And so we started our program by committing to cut our manufacturing emissions in half and to move to purchasing 100% renewable electricity. So we feel like getting our emissions lower first helps. But we know that even with all the innovation work, all the time that we're putting into it, there's still going to be a small amount of emissions that we can't eliminate in the short term. And that's where natural climate solutions come in. And, and that's where, you know, our key partnerships that we're starting to have externally are starting to make a difference. And so, you know, my first key learning, if I look back over the last year, is finding the right partner is key. You know, absolutely finding the, the NGOs that have the deep technical experience, the local partners that are familiar with the communities, the people that have the ability to go in and leverage our collective efforts at scale to make a meaningful impact in climate change it is the first and foremost thing you can do if you're a company starting down this journey is, is get the right partners and, and make sure that you're setting yourself up with the best and the brightest that are out there because they are the experts in the forestry work. They are the experts in these natural climate solutions. Um, I think my next learning, Shyla, if you asked me to, to frame up all three would be 
you know, as a company, we have to go where the carbon is. It's not where I want to work. It's where does Mother Nature need me to work? Um, and where can we have the biggest impact? So that, that impact is going to come from mangroves, from peat bogs, from mature forest, you know, places where we can go in and protect the forest, protect the biodiversity, protect the impact that we're having on these communities before it's eliminated, right? I mean, I, I love planting trees. I love going back in and restoring areas. And that's a critical part of what we do. But the most critical thing I can do today is to go in and protect the forests that are absorbing those high amounts of carbon and are kind of providing that carbon bank, the lungs for the planet. It's also, you know, clear that as science points us back to, you know, whether it's a global map of the carbon, that we go where that carbon is. So I think having the right partners, having the right location, making sure that we're going where the carbon is, those are two important things. And then our other big learning that uh, PNG continues to kind of put out in front is we touch nearly 5 billion consumers around the world. And those consumers have an amazing role and amazing power they can play in their everyday choices. That the small choices we make at home, whether it's washing your cold your um, clothes in cold water, whether it's maybe using a two-in-one shampoo to shorten your shower, any small change in the way that you use water and energy at home can make a huge difference when you multiply it across billions of people. And so we continue to work with our consumers on, you know, the role that nature plays, the role of, you know, how do we protect the biodiversity, the water benefits, the community benefits in these regions in addition to the carbon, but at the same time, the role that consumers can play in helping reduce emissions at home. It, it seems really uh, telling to me that uh, Procter and Gamble and the way that you're looking at corporate sustainability is beyond the fence line. It's it's not just staying within your lane. It's also recognizing the the uh, significant impact and influence that a company can have beyond um, your direct operations, but also in terms of raising awareness and and um, kind of a, a global collective action towards addressing climate change. So um, it's really really powerful. Um, so now I'll invite all of our speakers to um, have a, a short discussion. Reminder to all of our participants to use the red question button to submit um, any questions that you that might have come up as you heard our speakers um, deliver their interventions. Um, and we will turn to those questions after just a short round of um, follow up with each of our speakers. So um, I'm going to uh, pose individual questions to each of you, just following up on on what you've uh, what you spoke about in, in the earlier round. Um, so we'll start with you, Sven. Um, you mentioned a carbon market. So you spoke about the Agoro Carbon Alliance. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how the mechanics of, of this uh, new initiative in this market? Um, how do we make financing at the global level, especially when it's carbon markets, work for smallholders? and work for farmers that are working at the local level? Um, and, and, and how do you actually kind of um, streamline or facilitate that market in a, in a way that can deploy the funding directly to these smallholders? Yeah, and, and thanks for asking that, um, Shaila, because um, you know, what, 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 is, what, what will it take to fundamentally change farming. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, 25% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the food system. So that's clear. And if we can agree that uh, the farmers will play an important role in both uh, say reducing emission and even sequestering emissions, uh, what will it take and what will it cost to, to do that? And, and uh, I get frustrated in so, some of the arenas where I am and the forums where it seems like it's a huge price take to get that uh, done. But, but the reality uh, is that uh, I, I have a, a drink this coffee cup that uh, cost me two and a half dollars uh, in the coffee shop across the street. Uh, and if we break that down into its individual components, how much of that two and a half dollar goes to the coffee bean farmer? It's one cent. One cent goes to the farmer. Uh, so if we could change our mindset and say that, okay, let's incentivize the farmers to change their practices to uh, sustain and protect the environment, how much will it take? It's, it's a very, very small amount to enable that. But today's food system, how it's set up with silos and commodity plus pricing in every step of the chain, by the time it reaches the consumer, the cost will be prohibitive. And, and here, uh, I'm encouraged by what I see now in terms of technology, transparency, traceability, so that we can actually link from the consumer all the way to the to the farmer so that we, we, we make that change so we can 
increase the income for the farmers to enable them to to change their practices and that's what they want as well and i speak with a lot of coffee farmers they don't want double the price for the for the coffee beans uh, without any conditions they want it if they produce sustainably and if we could create that transparency create the the link with the consumers we can do a, a whole lot to, to 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 change this but it's it's more a mindset change or a cultural shift in how we think about food production than a, a money thing but at the same time we need to set up the structures and uh, that's where having a carbon marketplace uh, helps but also other ways to to measure the nutrition in the food the health of the soil to help the farmers to get this done and Sven, if I may ask you a follow up. So in this market, is the asset being valued, the carbon sequestration or storage potential of the soil? Or are you also monetizing and integrating other types of assets or other types of outcomes um, to deliver payments? Or is it solely focused on carbon and climate? In, in the Agora Carbon Alliance, uh, it's based on soil uh, or carbon sequestration in the soil. But I, I think it should be much more than that uh, in the future. We, we should pay based on uh, efficiency. You know, the, the more efficient you produce food on existing farmland, the less you need to expand and, and take away forest to clear way for, uh, for for new farmland. If you can maintain the soil balance and, and keep it healthy, there's no need to to, to expand and actually you can turn farmland back to nature. And, and, and there are studies on that that show that 40% uh, of existing farmland could be turned back to nature. Uh, and, uh, and, and if we had incentives in place to dry that, it would happen. But today, there's, it, it doesn't exist. So, 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 so it's, uh, it has many, many aspects and many opportunities and, and it's doable. We have the technology, uh, we have the practices. So it's, it's, it's all about uh, uh, the willingness to get it done. Yeah, I think nature has an incredible capacity and ability to recover um, if we stop dis disturbing or destroying it. So thank you, Sven. So um, Max, next question for you. Um, we've had a, a, a quite a flurry of questions also coming in from participants who want to know more about um, how um, uh, the Uplink Challenge actually works and, and what are the actual ways that innovators can get involved in the initiative. So maybe I'll, I'll ask you to address that. But, but maybe first, if we could kind of um, uh, take a step back and tell us a little bit about you know, the broader landscape of what's needed in terms of technology, policy, and financing. Um, how, how do you see 1T.org fitting within this broader landscape? And kind of what are some of those enabling conditions that would really help accelerate or amplify the impact of 1T.org? It's a great question. I mean, you uh, and the other speakers have already answered so so much of that. So I feel like I might just be repeating um, some of the the smart people in this in this group. Like I, I think I often am in this space because I'm still still have so much to learn. Um, you know, the 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 simple thing is, you know, what we saw a lack of for for one t dot org was um, private sector engagement and funding for this space. So you know, we need to scale up green finances. Shyly, you were you were talking about and. One way that we can do that is through the implementation of net zero targets. Um, you know, our first 10 million trees or so is actually um, all grants, but we do see um, more and more of our, of our progress and our efforts focused on supporting ecosystem conservation restoration projects that deliver climate benefits that we and others can easily identify um, and support. Um, as you know, at Conservation International, obviously, there's a lot that needs to be done um, to scale up that uh, process and make that a lot easier. And I think that's where we're really going to see uh, a lot of progress made this decade. Like I said, I mean, finding those projects that we've supported, salesforce.com slash trees, um, which I think folks should, should definitely check out, um, is... ...dedicated to this, and that's not going to be the case for every company. And which we also need every company to make. Um, so, you know, for 1T.org, <clears throat> the gap that we're addressing is trying to make that process easier, trying to facilitate the understanding of the science, be more of a link between the private sector and the great group of experts that exist in the world on ecosystem restoration and conservation um, in concert with things like the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration as well. 
Uh, of course, there's a lot more enabling uh, and complicated things that need to happen around that. So I, I really appreciate Sven's answer. I mean, we really need technology to enable better engagement, better support for the farmers of the world, um, as well as the landowners, as well as the foresters. Uh, and I, I'm excited to see that starting to come to fruition with the proliferation of earth observation technology and machine learning and a lot of the other technology innovations over the last couple of decades um, and the access to those. So you know, that's going to be critical. Uh, on the policy front, I think more there about um, uh, the, the gray finance side of the equation and removing some of the barriers that exist uh, to scaling up green finance. So, you know, we've been really excited to see things like the Replant Act in uh, the United States, um, which could help free up more funding for green finance, essentially, from, from the U.S. government. And we need more policy. Your other question was about Uplink, um, which I'm yes. absolutely happy to talk about, which is another answer to the, to the same question, actually. We need a lot more ecopreneurs and innovators out there in this space. Um, putting their full power, their, their brains towards this, you know, hairy problem, which we have not solved yet. Um, so Uplink is a, uh, you can literally go Google Uplink World Economic Forum and, and you will find it and it will give you the best directions for how to participate. But if you are an entrepreneur out there in the world um, and you are trying to combat or, or solve the, uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, there are essentially challenges that are going to be launched um, over the well, uplink really started in earnest a couple years ago and there's been a couple challenges already and it will continue to be more um, sahel challenge happening right now really regarded uh, related to ecosystem conservation and restoration and you'll see uh, when you go to the site that there's a couple different parts of the challenge um, whether it's about what are the technology solutions, earth observation technologies, or platforms, digital resources, things like that, or capacity building for, for grassroots efforts on the ground. Um, it's really a wide range of, of things, but basically um, entrepreneurs can uh, submit their solution to the challenge. And over the course of uh, several months, uh, a group of uh, experts will essentially review and help try and coach some of those challenges, um, getting towards the uh, conclusion of the challenge in which uh, a, a smaller cohort of the, what was 300 folks that uh, submitted solutions for the original One Trillion Trees challenge um, will be recognized at the World Economic Forum Summit or other similar kinds of events. Um, and I, I was really happy with the first group of cohorts that um, uh, won the, the One Trillion Trees Challenge. We had folks doing um, reforestation efforts. We have folks using technology platforms to funnel transactions, uh, uh, sorry, uh, finance from transactions to reforestation efforts, just like the, the whole gambit, um, which is why it's so great, because that's what we need. Thank you very much, Max. Um, so um, we have just about two or three minutes left. So James, you're, you'll have the last word here. Um, and a really important question, one that's been reinforced by um, our audience. Um, very cu curious for your perspective and your view on um, the fact that nature-based solutions have received a lot of criticism in terms of credibility, in terms of not uh, being greenwashing even. Um, how can, what can companies do to ensure that these projects, nature-based solutions projects, have real high quality impact on the ground that are credible? Okay, I, I think that's a good question. It's definitely one that we see in the news a lot today. Um, I, I think if we step back big picture and look at this, there is no perfect answer. There is no roadmap, right? I, I think we're trying to figure things out as we go. Um, much as the work that Yara is doing or the Salesforce is doing, um, we're trying to help pave that path forward so that other businesses and other industries can continue to invest in nature the same as we are. And I think that goes back to finding the right partners and the right projects um, so that we can try to make a difference. I think it's also important that as we as we kind of step back as a world, I love innovation, right? I'm an engineer by heart. Um, and, and so I love carbon capture. I want us to invent the next generation of carbon capture. We have amazing hundreds and hundreds of smart people working against it all around the world today, but it doesn't exist at the scale and the size that nature does to make a difference and an impact in today's climate. And so I think in the short term, in the next decade, natural climate solutions are a key 
key lever in the work that we're trying to do to make a difference in the climate today at the same time that we give the scientists the time to work on carbon capture and to work on the technological solutions so that we can pull more carbon out in the future. And so I think it needs to be a both and. Um, and as we think about the, you know, how do we make sure that these are credible? We need to make sure that we're not letting perfection um, be the enemy of progress. And so I think we need clear standards. We need to make sure we're always putting the communities first. You can't care about the planet and not care about the people on the planet. And so by focusing first on the communities and then looking at the broader impacts outside of carbon, like biodiversity, the water, um, stewardship in these regions, a lot of the areas that we're looking to protect and mature forests provide the water sources for entire regions of the countries that we're working in. And so, you know, I, I think nature has been an innovator for millennia. We need to look at this no different than the innovation we're doing in carbon capture and really say, hey, look, Mother Nature has reinvented the lungs of the planet. How do we go and work with her to absorb large amounts of carbon in these mature forests with these co-benefits? And Yes, it's 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 going to have some pros and cons, but how do we look at the big picture? And I, I want to be able to look back and tell my children and their children that we tried, right? That we tried our best and that we weren't afraid of the criticism and that we were willing to step up and take some risk and to learn together. So. Thank you, James. I think there could be no better note to end this event on. Um, we could have talked probably for hours on these topics, but uh, really mm -hmm. appreciate the your, your candor um, and your your insight, which which I, I'm sure our participants have have um, really enjoyed um, hearing directly from you on. Thank you for your leadership in this space. Um, and to all of our participants, there were a lot of questions. We will um, do our best to respond to them and post the responses in the library. So please refer to sdgtent.com and refer to the library under SDG 13. We will post more information and resources there available um, as a follow-up to this conversation. Thank you, everyone, and we'll uh, hope to have a follow-up conversation soon. Goodbye. Thank you, Shaila. It was a great meeting. So. Thanks, Shaila. Thank you.